And welcome to the If We Knew Then podcast. I'm Stephen Sox. And I'm Lori Sox. Today, we are joined again by Melissa Kynock. She shared her stories. Uh, we've had so many conversations together. And one thing we've really never talked about before is her son, Bertie's heart surgery. And a lot of parents experience that. And sometimes we don't know what to expect. And it can be overwhelming. So Melissa has agreed to talk about what her experience was in hopes of bringing awareness and some insight and comfort to anyone else who is on this journey or has taken this journey. And we're so thankful that she's here to do it. Welcome, Melissa Kynock. How are you doing? Good morning. How are you this morning? I'm good. I'm very well. Thank you. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you for having me again. You'll be sick of me. (laughs) No, I don't know. We could not be sick of you. (laughs) On our last conversation, we were talking about so many things. And the one thing that we didn't get to was your experience with Bertie and his heart. He had heart surgery early on. And I thought that having that conversation would bring comfort and be good for listeners out there because about 50% of children born with Down syndrome do have some kind of heart ailment and some structure that either needs correction through medication or ultimately could be surgery. Yeah, that's right. Any surgery, anything that they have to endure can just be stressful. And some of that is just based in fear of the unknown. So maybe having this conversation and also just going into it, knowing right off the bat that Birdie's doing great. Uh, yeah, I mean, he's thriving. You know, he's he's um, very vibrant, very healthy. His heart is healthy, but his general health is is tip top as well. So, Melissa, we're just going to let you talk and tell the story and your experience. Birdie was carried to full term. Just under, um, I was induced about four weeks early. They monitored me very closely because of Bertie's heart condition and uh, they were worried that he was um, a little bit on the small side. So they wanted him to sort of break the um, five pound mark and then they they induced me, induced me early, but but only, only four weeks, so not significantly so. And you knew about his heart ailment before he was born? Yeah. My very first scan when I was just under 13 weeks pregnant, and this is when they um, picked up that he may have Downs. So they sent me for a more detailed scan the following week. So I was about 14 and a half weeks pregnant, and that's when the consultant immediately picked up that he'd got a heart condition, which was just amazing because his heart chambers were like the size of a grain of rice. And they could see already that there was a problem with his heart and diagnose it. So, and at that scan, he he said with some other features that it was very, very likely that Bertie had got Down syndrome. And, and then I had a further test to, to confirm that. So I knew all of this really, really early on. How did that feel? It was terrifying. Yeah, it was terrifying. I educated myself as much as I could for, you know, for a layman very quickly and the hospital were informative and supportive. And one thing that they reassured me with was the condition of his heart really would only impact him once he was born. So I could kind of take a bit of a breath whilst I was um, pregnant, but his heart condition was so frightening and so overwhelming. We had a coffee, my family was with me, my mum was with me, my sister, my, my cousin, 
and we went for a coffee a coffee afterwards and I thought how am I going to get through this extremely long pregnancy without living every day in terror because that's not good for me it's not good for day and it certainly wasn't good for the baby that I was carrying what what can I do so I thought the first thing I have to do is name him so I'd uh, ask the consultant am I having a boy or a girl and he said I'm 80% sure you're having a boy so I, I knew that I wanted to call him Bertie I knew his, I wanted his middle name to be Baxter so I, I named him and I started planning for him being born you know I just thought I'm going to enjoy every single moment of being pregnant and it never took away the worry but it gave me something else to to focus on you know trying to keep it in the day and not let my mind run wild all of those things help, but I don't think anybody can then go back to being in denial that their child doesn't have a serious heart condition. I mean, once you know that, you you know that, don't you? So it was a case of learning to live with it, but really getting excited for him in the same way that I did for Di. And what was the diagnosis exactly? So Bertie had a complete AVSD, which... Earlier on, you said about 50% of children born with Down syndrome have congenital heart disease, and about 50% of those will have a complete AVSD. So it's very common what Bertie had, which means he had two holes in his heart. So in the top chamber, the walls separate in the top chambers, there was a hole there, and the same with the, the bottom wall. And then the valves that you know, stop the flow of blood into top and bottom chambers, they leaked. So they allowed blood to continue to flow through. So the problem, if that was untreated, I think um, not only does it sort of thicken the chambers of the heart, which would make it dangerous for him, the main problem is it doesn't drain his lungs off properly. And that was the main concern with this heart condition is irreparable damage it would do to his lungs. You said you you wanted to arm yourself with information. Where are some of the places or the supports that you, you turned to? That's a really good question because that is why it's so, what you do is so important because, you know, I read as much medical stuff as I could, as I, that I could understand. But my main source of... Um, not so much the information about what was wrong with his heart, but what surgery would look like, how it would impact us, me, how it would impact Day, what the steps would look like, what a hospital stay looks like. That I got from blogs from other parents who had been through that. And that was a real lifesaver because, I mean, for me, my anxiety gets lowered the more I educate myself. I like to be prepared. I also, uh, I read a, a lot of medical stuff specifically about his heart, but the blogs were a lifesaver. And so once he was born, how long did you have before he was going to have surgery? Surgeons need to find a balance of him being big enough for surgery, but not leaving it too long that his heart and his lungs are, are so damaged. So within his first two weeks, he went into heart failure, which I anticipated. They'd explained all of this to me. And that actually sounds a lot scarier than what the reality is. Heart failure sounds like a heart that's stopped. And in this case, it just means, just means, I mean, it's a big thing that his heart is not working as it should. So he had to go on to medication, which was a diuretic to start draining the fluid from his, his lungs. And that medication is, ha is how they maintain him, keep him well, to try and keep, get him big enough for surgery. For a, a long time, we were in hospital because he had some bowel issues as well. So that was monitored by the NICU team. And do you know what was so stressful about that period? was the feeding regime that I had with Bertie because I was militant about him not missing a feed <laughs> because every feed meant calories to make him a little bit bigger and ready for, for surgery and I was absolutely militant about it and it was stressful being in NICU I really wanted to breastfeed that was really important to me but the stress the no sleep uh, I had to go into medication to produce breast milk. 
and his feeding was every three hours, it would take half an hour to an hour to feed him with a pump that I had to gravity feed because it had to be done slowly so he didn't vomit it up. But first of all, I'd had to try and breastfeed him, which he wasn't learning how to feed <laughs> and he didn't have the energy to feed because of his heart was making him very lethargic and tired. He didn't have the learning capability to feed. So that was really gruelling. Then I'd have to um, gravity feed him. Then I'd have to <laughs> pump to try and keep my milk going um, because I could. he was really only probably feeding for like 10 minutes each side and that wasn't enough to keep my milk going. So it would take me at least two hours to feed him and then I only had another hour before the feed uh, started again. So it was exceptionally gruelling. Also being on my own looking after Day, who was three, dropping Day off at nursery school, flying over to, <laughs> to the hospital. Bertie was in the intensive care unit, back to pick Day up from nursery school, back to the hospital until the evening and couldn't, couldn't stay and then and back home again. And, and of course, having to leave your newborn, your newborn baby every night in hospital, it was really, really full on. So when he came home after eight weeks, some of the pressure was taken off a little bit because I hadn't got that um, backwards and forwards to the hospital. But then there's all these hospital appointments then <laughs> kick in. And I remember the one, I had six the one week, three in one day. I mean, that was like really relentless. It really is a full time job. And uh, the wrong time of year, it was Christmas time, winter, and not surprisingly, Bertie got bronchiolitis and ended up back in hospital, which again, no surprise, kind of, you know, anticipated it. But that was really frightening because he was just always had a tinge of blue and his chest would be really concave and then really um, struggling to breathe. I'm very lucky that my midwife is my cousin. <laughs> The midwife that delivered Bertie, Kevin, is also um, a paediatric nurse and we became very close. He has a cousin with Down syndrome, so he just adore, adored us. And I would video call <laughs> and get them to, you know, to look at Bertie because I was having to make these medical decisions of a, of a doctor who'd gone to medical school for, for years and years. That responsibility was now with me and that was really really stressful because with his heart it's not just this one big thing and his heart stops it's this gradual deterioration and so we don't always notice that and it's like well is now is is this the time where I should be ringing 999 and, and it was just very 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 stressful he had another week in hospital and when he came out I think we knew then that surgery really needed to be on the horizon. We were really hoping that we could push it till he was six months old, but that was looking less, less likely. And then just after Christmas, he was blue. Well, we, we were going for one of his vaccinations at the hospital and he looked blue, his hands looked blue. And I said, please, can you check his oxygen levels? And it was something like 62%. I mean, so they admitted him and that was that then. We, we were in hospital then just trying to get him well enough for him to have surgery. And really, he wasn't well enough. He had surgery on the 22nd of January. He wasn't well enough for surgery, but that was the the best the best option. We we couldn't we couldn't wait any longer. He really was very poorly. It's uh, it's really hard to believe now, you know. But he was very poorly. Well, I appreciate you talking about this because I know bringing this this up is going to be therapeutic for people and informational for people. But it, I know it can be difficult for you. One of the things you said was that you had to wait till he went into heart failure. And, you know, that's another one of those situations where a word can impact how we feel so much. So I just want to reiterate what I heard you say was that heart failure is just the heart not doing what it's supposed to do, but you already knew that the heart wasn't going to do what it's supposed to do. Because I think that all that preparation and getting yourself to that place of, acceptance so you can move forward that I feel like heart failure is one of those terms that can knock us back yeah sure sure the Bertie's dealt with two hospitals mainly 
when he was born, Birmingham Women's Hospital, and then the heart surgery was Birmingham Children's Hospital. And they gave me a lot of support. They were available, but I think importantly, they gave me a lot of education. So when I had Bertie's heart diagnosis, immediately and afterwards, they would constantly check in that I understood what they were telling me. So when they said, he'll go into heart failure and it could be around two weeks. Hopefully it'll be a little bit longer, but it could be a bit about when he was two weeks old. I knew exactly what heart fa failure meant in that context. Yeah, I just want to make sure that our, that our listeners know or anybody else, because they might not get the same kind of... The same kind of support, absolutely. Yeah. Because yeah. when we're talking about heart failure, you think heart attack, right? You think like cardiac arrest. But this means, in this context, it means the, the heart stop, which is really, really serious if it's left untreated. But it means that the heart now is not moving the blood around the body like it should. Let's talk about that you had to leave him in the NICU. I remember when Liam was born and we had to, you know, do the same thing and come home. And it's just such an unnatural feeling and frightening. I'm feeling it now, I think. Yeah. People can empathize, you know, we can all tap into some, some trauma. But I think people can only really, really understand what it's like if you've had a baby yourself because there's such trauma on your body, for one, a whole onslaught of hormones and emotions, exhaustion, but this bond that you have with your child, with your, you know, you've been, I've been waiting, you know, <laughs> nine months to, to, to meet him, to then not be able to take your baby home. And, you know, I was one of the lucky ones. I was told, best case scenario, I get a few moments skin to skin, they will have to check him in the room and then it's likely that he will then go to intensive care. Best case scenario, I'll have a few moments skin to skin. So I was prepared and there was that was really upset. I was devastated when I thought like I wasn't going to be able to hold him and breastfeed him. I was one of the lucky ones that when Bertie was born, he was on my chest and then he never, <laughs> he never went anywhere. He's, he was great. You know, he's all of his observations, everything was fantastic. They never needed to take him to NICU. I went up to the ward with in a couple of hours and the next morning I was discharged home it was the day after that that we started to then encounter problems and then we got whipped back into into hospital so I had all of that I know a lot of parents their ch their children get um, put into incubators immediately and it's weeks before they're able to touch their child but to have to leave every night to leave him there just I just thought this is I'm really showing such courage here that I'm actually dragging myself away from him. I really had to be brave and dig deep and drag myself away from him because I had another child to look after and there was just me. And also I had two dogs at home as well that were also my children, you know, my, and my one, my one dog died whilst Bertie was in, in NICU. I mean, it was just awful. It's an awful feeling to um, be separated from each from your child when child's so small. Was there anything that you did to help maintain that connection? Or I know I spent every moment that I could with him. I was there every day. I'm really lucky that I have this fantastic support network that really filters out to all of our areas in our lives. So it may not seem like a huge thing, but it was really significant for me that day's nursery school. The girls that work there are so invested in us as a family that they would have day early so I could get to the hospital. I needed to be there to breastfeed as much as I could because I was struggling with my milk. I wanted to be there anyway, but I also wanted to be there when the doctors were there. My cousin <laughs> is a very busy midwife, would be going and picking day up from school or bringing him to me I mean she was um she acted like a husband to me you know in my pregnancy and, and Bertie's early life I, mean, I have other family members that really help out but what I needed it was really significant and I had friends that were constantly checking in with me to make sure that I was okay you guys know that I'm a recovering drug addict and I attend meetings to maintain my sobriety and the girls brought a meeting to the hospital for me so I could still have a meeting 
I connected then with Wouldn't Change a Thing, our charity that Bert is an, an ambassador of. I connected with them and I had this huge support then via social media with parents that had experienced the same thing. That's what kept me safe. And just the, you know, the love of my son just kept me digging deep um, for that bit of energy to just keep keep going. You know, cause I just wanted to be with him. I wanted, I, I didn't, I couldn't, be, couldn't bear being away from him. That support system is so vital. And I know some some people don't have that support, but whoever you have, I think it's important. It's hard at that time to, to ask for help. I think there's so many emotions going on. You know, like even, even just after giving birth, you have so many changes as your body's changing and hormones and And it can be very overwhelming, but I think it's so important for us to be able to ask for help at that time from friends or family, or even just reaching out to whatever support groups are close to you. Well, and also we've mentioned wouldn't change a thing when we've talked to you many times. And although they're a UK based organization, it's a worldwide information there. I'll put a link in our show notes because they're a wonderful source of of information. Getting to know those NICU nurses, just having that communication and what they allowed us to do was I I bought a little... What are those? iPod shuffle. Remember those little iPods? We just put little earphones and cranked the volume up a little more and kept it in his incubator. I think we could put a hundred songs in there or something. We did some classical music and then we we read stories. We read stories to him and also like little things like, Hey Liam, how are you? We love you. And I wish somebody had suggested that to me. That's amazing. That's so beautiful. And it did two things because I think uh, I know classical music is great for cognitive and brain development. Also him hearing our voice, just like when you're, you know, in the womb, you know, hearing those voices to be familiar, the comforting encouragement, encouragement. And this, and so for all the benefits, Benefits that it did for him, for us, that moment of walking out of the NICU because you have to leave. Because I mean, we were allowed to stay overnight, but you know, we have Sophia, and it was, and the nurses were always like, "Go home, go home, and sleep." It, it was good for for me to feel like I was still there. Yeah, and they'd let it play until it ran out, and then they charge it for us. So that's why it's important to get to know those nurses. And Sophia and got to leave messages for Liam. It was it's pretty cool to to listen to those messages now. You know, a two year old telling her her brother, her newborn brother. But you know, when you talk about leaving your child in the NICU, it's not like you're you're leaving this newborn that you're so attached to instantaneously in some five star resort in Cancun. You know, like where. Wow, what a you know you're in you're in a NICU which for as comfortable as you can make it you're in a hospital and your child is and is there for a reason and so when your child is sick or unhealthy or you want to man you'll stay up all night just looking at your child you know when you talk about Sleeping having a birdie home and you see he's blue you probably didn't get any sleep that night you're just looking at him and yeah. and not being able to do that is very difficult. Yeah, very difficult. Like you say, you're not you're not leaving not leaving them um, in, in a happy place. And he, I remember the one um, time he was having problems with his bowels, and he needed to be transported via ambulance to Birmingham Children's Hospital for them to check him out there. And it's just constantly this. My, all of Bertie's hospital stays, whether it was in. Birmingham Children's, because we lived there. When it was Birmingham Children's, we lived there. Or whether it was NICU, I was constantly pulled off. If I'm doing this for Bertie, I'm not being there for Day. This is a strain on on Day. Um, if I spend time with Day, then Bertie's on his own in the hospital. And just, I couldn't clone myself. And it was this constant pull. And on this night, he needed to go via ambulance. But I needed to organise day. I also needed to come and feed my dogs, you know, like were like my children. And just this dashing home to try and organise everything to get back to be able to travel in the in the ambulance with him. It was just it's like this onslaught of responsibilities and things that need to be done. It's it's you can't you never and I'm sure you felt the same never did I leave him did I forget that I was leaving him in hospital never like that that never that my child was well that never went from my mind not once 
Yeah, no, it's it's a heavy thing that we carry that we carry. And you know, as you're talking about all of that and the stress, I just want to communicate how important it is to have those relationships with the nurses. And for the most part, we had great nurses who took care of Liam. It's okay to ask questions. It's okay if you see something that doesn't feel right to question that. It's okay to ask for someone else because different personalities work for different families. And and sometimes having the person that you trust when you're walking out that door, instead of walking out that door going, oh, last time, you know, they put that vacuum up his nose and just having those unnecessary fears could, that's when your advocacy starts, right? That's It's okay to say, this is the nurse I feel comfortable with, or, or maybe I don't feel comfortable with that, or to ask the doctor when the doctor tells you something, why? What does that mean? Because all of that information, that's how we participate. And it can, when you're running around, if you have other children that you're having to take care of, if you have a job that you have to do, all of those things, you're right, you never forget. Like there's not a moment in your day that you aren't thinking about your child. So these are these are things that we can do to help us when we walk out the door. Yeah. You made a really good point earlier about, you know, asking for help. And I think it's not something that we do really easily. It doesn't become natural to us to ask for help because we don't know what to ask for and we're not well practiced at it. Thankfully, I've become well practiced that I know what help I need. So that wasn't a great leap for me. But I think anybody who's going into this, get in touch with um, the charities and the, the support groups sooner rather than later and start um, making those connections. Practice now, asking the questions, getting in touch, getting names and numbers, keeping contact because be a lot more second nature for when your child is in hospital, is going through surgery to ask a doctor for another opinion or can you explain that more? Or I've read something else that contradicts that or I've read something that's better than that and complements that. All of this stuff is a lot less anxiety provoking to implement. It's empowering to be able to participate. Absolutely. And it can alleviate a lot of the fear of the unknown because you know a little bit, you know, just a little bit because there are, the reality is those feelings of not being in control, the fears that can happen from the unknown. You're right. Just having that information and you got the diagnosis at 13 and then 14 and a half weeks, you can start reaching out. And finding that information out so that way you are prepared. And I think that it helps alleviate some fears. Yeah. It does. Yeah, it does. Well, I know we're going to talk about the actual surgery, and that's even um, more stressful stuff. But I wanted, before we got into that, I wanted to, because I'm feeling a little stressful in my mind, remembering our experience with Liam in the NICU and, 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 and also relating with your experience. But I like to tell parents out there that are maybe in this situation now, or they believe this is coming up, maybe they're at their 14, 15th week, find out that their child, that this could be the path their child is going to have, that they're going to have to go through this. Now we're 11 years later, but it's gone. That's, that's not a feeling I feel anymore. That's not a stress I feel anymore. It's just like everything in my life in the moment. If you can prepare yourself, give yourself the tools, get through that. And then you're through. We weren't prepared. We were not. We were not prepared. <laughs> we That's why I would have prepared. you on, because <laughs> this is if we knew then. If um, <laughs> if I could hear someone in a podcast say, "It's going to be okay. Get through this, and then it's over." Yeah. You're you're not thinking about this anymore. You're on to this beautiful life. Yes. And good times. So. And it happens to a lot of people. It's, yeah. it's not, it's not uncommon. No. Even just a NICU stay is not uncommon. Even oh, and the if, doctors and nurses were so much oh more like, goodness. Hey, this is, this is okay. I mean, this is, we do this. Liam was born under two pounds and he was born uh, 10 weeks early and he is a healthy, strong young man. Yeah. Right. Well, and, 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 and there's so, kids born earlier but than him. When that happened in the moment, that was so much But yes, if we could have heard someone then say, yeah, it's going to be scary and you're not going to know how, but modern medicine is amazing. What can be done is amazing. The tests, the, uh, the medical support, just, just, it's amazing. If I had thought about the nurses and and doctors really, if I had taken in what they were saying to me was we've done this, this is so many times, this This is is what we do. We're glad he's this week. We're glad he's this amount of weeks you know they've they've seen 
smaller things smaller and earlier yeah they've seen other things and 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 that's been fine too so that's just a little just something know. to tell yeah. parents yeah you had talked about that you had to make medical decisions and i was wondering what kind of medical decisions did you have to make how did you go about navigating them? And then you said that you had to monitor before you called. I'm guessing when you had to call 999, that meant this is when we need to do the surgery. Is that is that correct? I mean, the medical decisions really would be monitoring Bertie, knowing that he was slowly deteriorating and that was to be anticipated and to not be at the hospital every five minutes, calling an ambulance every five minutes when it wasn't necessary to make those decisions. And the responsibility was on me because I'm the one looking after him. He was also fed through a tube. So I had to learn how to thread a tube. He was constantly pulling it out, how to stick it to his face, to aspirate him, to make sure that it was going into the right place and to, into his tummy, to give him his bowel medication, all of his heart medication. Um, I, you know, I felt like a nurse. I felt like a medical professional, especially with, he would pull his tube all the time. And I thought, I don't have the time to be taken into the hospital to do this. I'll learn to do it myself. So I learned to do that quite quickly. I could do that quicker than I could change a nappy in, in the end. So that was like, that was the medical stuff. With calling the ambulance, it was when he had a temperature, he really did look a tinge of blue and just how laboured his breathing was. It was now, now this is this is next level. And this is this is something else. I think just because there is such a huge strain on the NHS here, not wanting to make that any worse, you know, but also wanting to put my son first. The medical stuff that you had to do, how did you handle that? It really, at the time, it didn't feel like anything. It was only afterwards that I look now, in hindsight, that I go, man, <laughs> like, who does that? <laughs> like, who has to do that? You know, but at the time, it was just, well, this is what my son needs, right? So, like, you do it. You know, it is something that becomes second nature to you, but that can feel overwhelming. So, at the time, did it feel overwhelming at all? Um, I think at the time I probably was quite robotic and didn't think too much, just did. And it wasn't until afterwards reflecting that, especially about the feeding regime where I'm just so exhausted now, I look back and go, how did I do that? How did I manage that? I think what helps us is I'm very organised. I'm an organised person. I have a big capacity to juggle lots of things. And I naturally like a very full life. So um, I probably have a personality type that does quite well under those those situations. But I don't think I really kind of sat and pondered on it too much. I just did it. I know you wanted to get to six months, but you didn't get to that six months. How old was Bertie when the decision was made to finally go into surgery? He was three months. And you want to talk about that process, the decision process, and then your prep and surgery? So by that time, Bertie's dad, Richard, was really involved with Bertie, which was really nice on on many, many levels. But I'd always anticipated that I would be going through heart surgery by myself um, because that was always the the plan. Richard wasn't involved during my pregnancy or at the beginning. He he didn't, he, he couldn't, you know, this fear, he couldn't. So he came, he came up to visit us he was he lives down in by London so he was coming at weekends to to visit and Bertie got admitted into hospital within a few days that said he really needs his heart surgery and then Richard never left again he gave up his his job he just couldn't he couldn't leave him he couldn't be away from him he couldn't couldn't bear it so that was nice that I had that to begin with. I had that companionship to help me emotionally, that somebody else is experiencing pretty much what I was experiencing. The only difference was, was I'd already got another child that I was also trying to care for as well. At Birmingham Children's Hospital, they've got parent accommodation there, the Ronald McDonald House, which is amazing. It's across the road from Bertie's ward. It's just it's just a room and a bathroom, but it meant that the three of us were able to, to stay there. 
and we were there from the January. We were discharged on March the 11th, so we were there for for a couple of months. So, yeah, we we were transferred over to that hospital, and Bertie's surgery was cancelled twice. Which, thankfully, I'd read blogs where this had happened, so I was prepared for that because that's quite something when you know that your child is going down for sort of six, seven hour surgery. So there's all of these feelings um, that I'm going to have to say goodbye. And this might be goodbye, goodbye, because they've given me the percentages of babies that, that don't survive. You know, there's just this onslaught of fear and love and more fear and anxiety. And then, then the surgery doesn't happen. And it's such um, mixed emotions of relief. Because, you know, if I'm going to lose him, I'm not, if he's going to die, he's not going to die today. And another, you know, sort of 12 hours with him. But also not wanting to go through all that again and know that he's desperately ill and he, and he needs the surgery. So it really is this huge roller coaster of emotions. But I knew, I knew that that was possible. So I was kind of prepared for that. And then the morning that he did go for surgery, as I say, Rich was with us and, uh, you know, you have to wash them in a special solution to, to clean them. And um, so we then carried him to theatre and um, took him into the room and uh, lay him on the bed while he's then going to have um, his anaesthetic. And so they gave us... <sighs> <laughs> they gave us some time to just say goodbye to him and um uh it's like just being in a twilight zone it's really very hard to articulate just so dissociated from my from a body it's like it's happening to me but it's also like I'm observing it and uh very very hard to articulate what that felt like and we both said goodbye and I just told him um, how much we loved him and um, how special he is. Uh, you know, you have to drag yourself away, you know, and uh, and thank God Richard was there because we, we left the room and we just we just both sobbed, just sobbed and sobbed. Um, it's quite something, yeah, it's quite something to, to experience. But Richard and I, we get on so well, you know. <laughs> We get on so well, we always have done, and we make each other laugh. And Bertie was in surgery for seven hours, which is a long time, but it didn't feel particularly long at the time. I expected to feel like it would really drag, but it didn't. And now looking back, it seemed like it went like went like that. And we just we have a, we have real gallows humor and we just made each other laugh. We went for breakfast. And we made, we just we made each other laugh. We really carried each other through probably the most horrific, horrific thing that we'd experienced up to date. And really grateful for that. You know, I mean, yeah, really grateful that Richard could give that to me and that I wasn't I wouldn't have been on my own. My mum would have been there with me, but it wouldn't have been the same. And so then we uh, took ourselves to the family room in Piku and we waited for him. I think the most frightening part was that I knew they were going to connect him up to a machine, stop his heart. All the blood was going to be drained from his heart so they could operate on him. I mean, his heart was like the size of a walnut. Like you said, like the wonders of modern medicine. It's like magic. It really is something something out of Hogwarts. It's just how, what they can do. And a machine is uh, working as his heart by pump, pumping his his blood around his body but then of course once his heart's repaired they've then got to get his heart going again and he also still had bronchiolitis which was very very dangerous and he did have a few complications during surgery and I think that's why his surgery took a little bit longer but he made, you know, obviously he made it back to Niku after seven hours. And um, what the hospital had done for us is before Bertie had gone to surgery, they'd taken us into Piku and showed us round to, to prepare us. I'm really glad they did that because in my mind, I was expecting Niku, which is dark and quiet, because you know, most of the babies shouldn't have been born yet. 
and PICU in Birmingham Children's Hospital is very different. It's very noisy, it's very busy, it's bright lights everywhere. It's like a huge sort of gymnasium room. I thought that it would be like NICU, you know, small rooms with maybe four kids to a room and it's it's not like that. And there's children there that are um, having heart treatment or have been in serious car accidents. So, uh, you know, they really prepared a lot of machines, a lot of machines, lots of tubes. So I was prepared for him to look like that. What I wasn't prepared for was how swollen his head was. His whole body was really bloated, but his head, he didn't look recognisable. He really, he really didn't. Yeah, it's a shark. It's a shark. It's a shark because you can't fully prepare yourself to see your child looking like that. What was the swelling from? What was the head swelling from? Um, they told me that that was very normal. It's a mixture of like the medication. Um, I can't, you know, I can't. So there's so much that I've just forgotten. You know, just like I, know, I need to forget that. And the, this, the specific reason for that, I can't, I can't remember. It was a mixture of of lots of things. Again, it was they just kept saying it's normal. It's you know, it's normal. But I that hadn't been mentioned, and I hadn't read about that in all of the information that I'd gathered beforehand. Bertie was in hospital f- in intensive care for about two weeks. And you guys will have experienced this in NICU. It's not a linear recovery journey, is it? It's not like that. You kind of go like that and then back again. And then you go off there and then there's that. And then that's okay. And then and then you'll need another drain put in. And then his lung collapsed. And, and then he became, he stopped breathing by himself. And he um, had seizures and he had to go for a CAT scan. And we really thought we'd lost him at that point. And so, it, you know, it was just all this backwards and forwards constantly looking at the machines you do become a doctor because you understand what all the machines mean you understand what the medicines do you understand what the charts do wanting every little bit of information that I could get I thought about this the other day we kept a a diary whilst we were there it's something that the hospital recommend that you do I've never read it I can't I can't read it you know it's um maybe one day but it's just uh, yeah, I can't can't read it at the moment. Another thing that I wasn't prepared for, and this won't be on everybody's journey, but it's common, right? The day after his surgery, and I arrived at, in the morning, we arrived at Pico, and as I arrived, there was a young lad having uh, chest compressions. So he, he died, and so they were trying to revive him, and he, he they couldn't, you know, he, he died. And then later on in the day, there's more babies of Bertie's age in the bed right next to us and the beds are closed, you know, so, and that baby died as well um, next to us. And, you know, that's the, that's the sort of stuff that, hey, can you, it doesn't matter how much you read, like you just can't prepare yourself for having children die around you. Just, no, I don't think anybody can, um, can prepare, prepare for that. And that's really, I think, you know, when the nurses really um, come in to like being these angels because they're not just there saving my child's life, they're also this huge emotional comfort and support, um, you know, for, for me as well. And um, massively grateful for, um, for that care that we, that I received, you know, as well, not just what they gave, but... Uh, it's so tra- traumatic and relentless and you're not at home and the worry and the machines and this onslaught and senses and just seeing what Bertie is going through physically and the pain that he's in and one of the worst things the worst things was when they started taking him off all of the the drugs and how he we, you know he detox he went into withdrawals from the drugs so that tri- triggered loads for me and all of this at the time no parent has the time to process that it's just kind of I I compartmentalize that kind of look at it later and I think the worst thing that I could have done then was never look at it again and it because it still impacted me it still massively impacted me and I got to um, a place, you know, I think I mentioned this with you guys um, before last year where I thought I really need somebody, a professional to help me through this um, trauma. And I had some proper trauma therapy around our time in um, in Pico because 
it's, it's very, very difficult to explain to somebody what it feels like to to be there. Um, let alone with, with you know, um, is my child going to survive as well? Being around the other children because we're compartmentalizing when we're going through it, it makes us connect with the reality of the loss. There's a part where we're doing what we need to do to push through and there's a reminder of the possibility of loss. And there's so many other things, so many other emotions that go along with that. And the truth is in a hospital, there were other children in there that didn't have Down syndrome that weren't necessarily on the same journey or with the same challenges. And what it did was it reminded us how frail life is. And that's something I don't think has ever left me, just that the value of every single moment. Also, for me, it really took a lot of the focus off Liam's diagnosis. Yeah, I, mean, I didn't even think about that. Down syndrome, like, it just wasn't, wasn't there. Right, it, it wasn't, it wasn't there. I think we should talk about that because I think we need to take care of ourselves. I think mental health is so important, whether you find someone to talk to, whether you write it down, but whatever it is, just to be able to process it so we're not holding on to it. Because what, what happens is we hold on to it and it comes out in different ways. It's erosive, definitely, yeah. You had mentioned that the surgery was postponed twice. Yeah. What were some of the reasons why they had to postpone the surgery? Um, the first reason was there was, wasn't the beds in, um, in Pico. The bed that they got lined up for Bertie, there was a, another child that needed it more. And then the next day, there wasn't the theatre space, as simple as that. Um, in fact, Bertie has a little friend called Che, and he also has Down syndrome, and he was born four days before Bertie, different hospitals. But me and his mum, Tony, connected really early on through our local ups and downs group. They, they put us in touch with each other. And the boys, exactly the same heart condition. They've been in hospital <laughs> together with bronchiolitis. They were then together for their heart surgery. Che had um, surgery a couple of days before Bertie, and then our hospital stay uh, after surgery was weeks, weeks, weeks and weeks. And that family were there with us the whole way. And that's when you do go, you know, high dependency room and there's just the two of you in there. The boys are so similar. I mean, we joke about it all the time. If one's got one, we know the other one's going to do exactly the same. I, I can't wait until they're older. They're going to be like Ibiza and Magaluf holidays to, together. But to have this family there walking literally the exact, <laughs> path that we did uh, was such a support to me because I mean they're great people as well but I think Che's surgery was cancelled maybe four or five times so that also prepared me that the hospital that we were in it was going to be probably the same for Bertie because they were there a couple of days before us yes <laughs> it's amazing the support that you get along that I've had along the way I'm very 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 blessed and that can give you comfort just to know because it can be overwhelming. It It's overwhelming because you want this done now and to have that canceled, that's really a heavy load. And just to know that it, I just to be able to go, okay, this happens, this happens. And speaking of comfort, how soon after surgery did you get some news of the success of the surgery or something that would be some news to have some comfort? Immediately, as soon as they brought him from theatre to Piku, they said, as much as we can see now, it's all gone well. The holes were patched up well. The problem really was probably going to be all of the other things associated with surgery and how well they'd managed to repair the leaky heart valves because they were so tiny. And I also knew, because they'd educated me, that it would be highly unlikely that they would ever be fully repaired. They probably will always have some leak, which may mean further surgery. And I, we didn't know whether that further surgery would be the following week, in six months' time or six years' time. So that was sort of, we needed him to recover from surgery, but we needed to see how his valves were going to operate but yeah like immediately as soon as they handed him over to the PICU team we knew that surgery had gone well 
but there was just massive complications after surgery um you know a collapsed lung and and the one night um he'd become very overheated and um his eyes were rolling at the back of his head and it was just um it was it was horrific it was really really horrific and we'd eventually left him to go back to the room and you know when the phone rings really early hours of the morning you know that it's only one thing and it was the hospital and they said you need to to come over so we just ran we ran we ran to um intensive care and he'd stopped breathing for himself and he'd become completely unresponsive the the machines were breathing for him and he needed to go for for a cat scan and i was just i was becoming hysterical i was really hysterical i thought i thought that was it i thought he died and we we, we weren't gonna we weren't gonna get him back you know and he, he recovered from that really really quickly you know within days he was recovering from that so it's, i think maybe that i wasn't prepared for um even though i knew like with with nico it had been sort of you know one step forward two back and start a sideways step i kind of wasn't anticipating all of those very huge complications after surgery because each of them are so overwhelming yeah on their own yeah just on their own that individually is a huge big thing for, for his little body to have gone through but also for you, like as a parent, if your child goes to hospital for anything and in the middle of the night stop breathing, that alone, I have to say thank you so much for sharing this story because I do think that it will help. I think it will help not make things so unknown, like to know, you know what, this happens, this happens. And when those things that come at you that are so huge to just know this happens because once we get through all of this, we're going to know <laughs> Bertie's doing great. Yeah, I don't even th- I don't even think that he's got a heart problem. It's not on my radar whatsoever. And I, and I will say to balance it up, a lot of the blogs that I read of babies the same age having the same surgery were back home within a week. You know, kids with Down syndrome were back home within a, in a week. Bertie's complications were drawn out because he went he had bronchiolitis and that made it um his recovery a lot longer I think and I you know I think this is the same actually for, for for his little friend you know but I read I read lots of stories and the kids were in and out throughout this conversation just the the emotions that are there uh, allow yourself to have them absolutely you can't your child is in a bed fighting for their life with a thousand tubes and wires and machines in pain and you can't even pick them up and give them a hug like it's it's going to impact you it's going to impact you and and the best self-care that anybody can give themselves to recover from that because you as a parent need recovery as well is to talk about it just have somebody witness just witness your story that can say to you oh my god like you went through something really big (laughs) that's really big You know, you're right. We go back to our last conversation and it was about seeing and being seen. And I think that does allow us to continue to to let some steam off. And then, all right, now I'm going to go forward, have that cry, talk to someone. And then it helps us to, all right, here we go again. Here we go. Stepping back in. I'm moving through it. It's massively cathartic for me to, for somebody else to, to hear what I went through. And give me, um, you know, the the love uh, after that. I found it very cathartic. I'm, I, you know, I felt the emotion and I moved through it, and um, and I, and then I've let let it go. Like when I when I talk about it now, it, yeah, of course it's going to bring up emotion, but it's not something that um, I live with every day. Bertie doesn't live with it every day. It's not something. Bertie's surgery and hospital stays is, is not something that. Um, we carry as a great big bag of rocks in our life now. It re- it really and truly isn't because I think we all we've taken responsibility for our own emotional well being as well as taking responsibility for Bertie as well. Bertie got through the surgery. How long was that recovery process before he could go home? We we were in hospital. I think um, in that stay like nine weeks. It was an exceptionally long amount of um, amount of time. He was doing well. He just needed that drip of oxygen, and they really didn't want us to come home and have oxygen fitted into the house 
which we, we you know we were in agreement with but it was that extended period really really started to take its its toll because of how much it was impacting day yeah, like what kid wants to go and spend sort of 16 hours a day sat next to a, a hospital bed but I just didn't want to leave Bertie plus I was trying to breastfeed him you know so again you know having lots of uh, emotional support and I know how to look after myself but there's only so much any human being can take. Is there anything about coming home that transition the care any of that that you want to share? When we came home, and hopefully won't happen for anybody else, but it was perfect timing for us, we went immediately into lockdown. <laughs> because as we were leaving hospital, all these COVID regulations were starting to be implemented. The consultants were starting to get fearful about our kids coming into contact with anybody that had got coronavirus. So for us to come home, just lock the doors, it meant that my dog that could spend some time with me at last. It meant that Day wasn't at school. Richard moved in. We got to be at home. We like, particularly me and Day, we love being at home. We love being in our home. And that we could just start like being parents to Bertie, you know. And so for us to go into lockdown was much needed family time without having to worry about other people. It has been really been nice as as you know it, we've all been vaccinated and things have become safer that we you know can start mixing with friends and family because not all of my family's even met Bertie yet same with some of Richard's family but um, we had fantastic help from all of Bertie's healthcare professionals it did just mean a lot of it was either over the phone or they would be heavily gowned up but you know like it becomes the normal doesn't it so that really worked for us other people it might have just driven them even more insane after they'd been imprisoned in hospital that might not have worked for other people but as a family it worked for us but you know I think that's the self-care that we talk about that we don't take that only a pandemic can make us take in our society any kind of grief or mourning just we're not given the time we're not giving transition time for loss or challenge we just keep going keep going so it does bring to mind that just the importance of it's okay to just bond and take that time. And, you know, the people who love you will understand. Yeah, so even if you've not got a pandemic, <laughs> you know, it's all, it's all right to, to shut yourself away. I mean, we'd lived on microwave meals for months, you know, for months, months. It was just nice to cook have vegetables and you know it was just it was a little things it was a, in the hospital there was just a wet room the shower it was a shower it was nice that day he could have a bath and play in the bath and have all of his toys around there was no one big huge gesture that started to heal us it was a thousand of those little things Bertie had to heal physically and we all had to heal emotionally and, and psychologically yeah that's so important when Liam was in the NICU and we had not nearly as long of a stay, but it was true. You know, we had Sophia and she went every day and we were there all day and just eating the Tuesday was macaroni and cheese in the hospital and they had really delicious eclairs. And oh, yeah. like when you know the hospital's menu. Yeah. Meat, <laughs> the, meatloaf Thursday. Meatloaf Thursday. <laughs> and I've been here too long. <laughs> uh, I remember a neighbor of ours made a roast chicken with potatoes on a real platter and brought it to us with like silverware and that was so healing like to this day like I'm always so thankful and I just I let her know how much that one meal just the the on, on a on a real plate maybe it's that we went through this big thing that other people aren't going through and now we get to go back to living and those things, those everyday things that maybe we might have taken for granted. And I say this all the time about my journey with Liam, you know, and Sophia as well. But those moments, I feel fortunate that I'm so thankful for every moment. So now we're two years old. How's that look? Yeah, I wish he was like here that I could just get, and here he is. <laughs> He's a vibrant, like Bertie is, is vibrant. The physical stuff, um, if you didn't know he had a heart condition, you wouldn't know. You know, um, they only want to see us on an annual basis now. 
he's not on any heart medication. I was going to get a tattoo of a scar down here. So me and him would have, a, thank God it didn't because his is nearly gone. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have some like weird tattoo on my chest. <laughs> there's really, there's very small remnants left, you know, that he, he had heart surgery. So that just doesn't appear in our world at all. But he's very happy, very loud. <laughs> <laughs> he's a real joy Bertie wherever I take Bertie whatever shop I take him into wherever I take him he brings the place to a standstill you know he's that extra chromosomes there's such magic in it you know he's uh, he has quite a following you know he's really adored by uh, so so many people he's got so many people rooting for him not only do they want to see him like physically get well, they want to see what his day-to-day life looks like because they really invested in him. As you're telling the story, when we get to the end of the story, and then you said, uh, you know, the extra chromosome, and it occurred to me, we haven't mentioned Down syndrome. Like, oops, I forgot. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing your story, Melissa, because we haven't really talked about it. And one of the, I guess, goals that I've, I've said is, you know, this journey can sometimes be you're reaching out in so many directions, advocating and all of the things that we do as parents that we've talked about so many times. And I'm working to shift my focus on the same vein of like seeing and being seen and seeing everybody for who they are. And just remembering that every life that we come in contact with, that we're so blessed and fortunate, our mailman, our best friend, it's such a gift. And I think I got really wound up or caught up in the stresses. We still advocate for those. Those are there. But seeing our friends and asking questions, I'm taking that time now to do that. It took me 11 years. <laughs> but I'd realized that we talked so many times. And this is such a big part of your journey. And sharing that story can also help others. And I realized I'd never asked. And for that, I apologize. But I'm so thankful that you were willing to share this. I'm just really thankful. And so thank you. Thank you. Thank you for asking me. I, I, hope, I hope that I can give somebody um, what somebody else gave me when I, when I did my research. Well, I think about when I first saw your story and just that little trailer that we got in the United States and, and the feeling I had about you as a human. I just knew it. And to be able to contact you and then you got back to us and we had a talk and now we've had several talks. We're blessed to have you in our lives. I love you. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Likewise, likewise. It's, it's, it's a special relationship for me as well. Give my love to the kids. Okay. Bye bye. Bye, guys. Please follow us on Twitter at If We Knew Then Pod, and you can drop us a line on our Facebook page at If We Knew Then Pod, or visit our website If We Knew Then to send us an email with questions and comments. And you can join our mailing list there and get alerts of future podcast episodes. All these links will be added to this episode's show notes. Thank you again, and we look forward to you joining us on the next episode of If We Knew Then. Chromosome.